All right, so uh, thanks to John Leonard, thanks to Mort. It's really an honor to be able to do this. Uh, Andy's one of my mentors. Uh, I disagree with him here. So uh, I don't know if I can be quite as spirited as he was, but uh, I, there were some points that I think were missing uh, and you'll see some of the same data sets and, and we'll see how we can put it into perspective. Uh, this is very similar to Andy's first slide. Uh, I wanted to emphasize that we're really focused on the high tumor burden patients. Uh, for stage one, I think observation or radiation therapy are reasonable. And for low tumor burden patients, I would not advocate for chemotherapy at least right away. But for the high tumor burden patient, that's, that's the group that we're focused on. And I think it's important uh, when we have these discussions to frame in our minds why we're treating these patients. Um, ideally, we'd like to change the natural history of the disease. Uh, Andy made the point that overall survivals have been very hard to show uh, improvement with the exception of the addition of anti-CD20 therapy to regimens. Um, you'd like to be able to decrease transformation risk, um, it's not really clear we can do these things, certainly by choosing a different chemotherapy backbone. So the second option may be prolonged remission. And I'd say that for patients who are appropriate for chemoimmunotherapy up front with high tumor burden, you'd like to think about a complete remission, if you could, um, as a means to obtain a long remission. And the reason, presumably, to obtain a long remission is that patients feel better. But I think we always have to remember that if you're not curing people, we're trying to make people feel better with the regimen. So we have to think about improving quality of life as well. And how you measure quality of life during and after treatment is something I think we all need to learn more about. Um, but to the degree we can think about side effects of treatment, both in the short term and long term, I think that's a very appropriate uh, consideration when you make an upfront treatment decision in follicular lymphoma. Uh, two caveats, uh, I do believe CHOP-based therapy is preferred for grade three histology and for suspected histological transformation. I'm sure Andy would agree with that. Um, in many of the studies that were cited, grade three histology was not included. But for the vast majority of patients who are not in these groups, I hope to demonstrate that bendamustine-based therapy is preferred. So we'll take another look at the STILL trial. Uh, again, uh, this was the randomized trial that I agree put bendamustine on the map for upfront therapy. It compared BR versus CHOPR. There was no maintenance uh, built into this study. Uh, if you take a look at who these patients were, um, it would appear from the uh, patient characteristics that they are a rather representative group. Um, almost half of the patients had high flippy scores, high risk flippy scores and about a third of the patients had bulky disease um, and an increased LDH. Uh, the other point about this is that all of these patients needed to satisfy criteria for treatment, which is somewhat different from other trials, including the SWOG trial that, that Andy alluded to. Many of the United States trials, I think people in the United States, particularly early in the R chemo era, were treating a lot of patients who might have traditionally been observed. Uh, so toxicities of this treatment, um, I think people who have used both of these regimens would appreciate that in the short term, bendamustine for most patients is better tolerated. There are perhaps more skin rashes that are seen and more allergic reactions, but infectious episodes are substantially higher with, with RCHOP. Septic episodes are higher with RCHOP. Um, you see alopecia 100% of the time with RCHOP, and you don't see that with, with bendamustine and rituximab. So I, I think that um, to the degree these are important considerations, we should c at least consider them uh, when we're making treatment decisions. So this is the long-term outcome. And I would humbly disagree with Andy that that RCHOP curve looks so bad. Um, so keeping in mind that these are patients who all needed treatment, which was a subset of patients on the SWOG study, you're still out at about 40% uh, at 10 years of follow-up. That's not that different from all the other RCHOP curves. The median um, time to next treatment was 56 months. That's not that different either. 
Uh, I agree that the overall survival, there's absolutely no difference. And so therefore, um, some of the consideration needs to be made as far as toxicity and tolerability by the patients. So if we just take this study, um, I think there's a unique toxicity profile. Fewer infections, less neuropathy, no alopecia. And with long follow-up, the progression-free survival continues to be longer with BR compared to RCHOP. You need fewer salvage regimens after BR compared to RCHOP, and there's no difference in overall survival. Okay, so then the BRIGHT study. Um, I th Andy nicely went through the design, and I agree with him that it's a confusing design, and it does make interpretation of this study difficult. Uh, so the initial results that were published, um, the primary endpoint did show a benefit in complete remission rate to BR therapy. And that might predict for, for better outcome long term, and, and we'll see if that's true. The safety was different, uh, uh, somewhat different from what was seen in the STILL trial. But s although there was increased hypersensitivity, uh, nausea, vomiting, which wasn't really a signal in the STILL trial, and lymphocytopenia, again, there was more neuropathy, alopecia, and neutropenia with RCHOP. But I think importantly, uh, last year there was a quality of life adjunct to this trial that did get published, and it showed, to the degree we can measure these things, an improvement for the patients treated with BR in many uh, domains of a quality of life survey instrument. Um, and it showed that symptoms were less with BR and that patients felt better when they were taking and after BR therapy compared to RCHOP. And in a disease where we're not curing people and we're trying to make people feel better, I think that, as I said, regardless of what import you put on that particular quality of life study, it's something we need to do better when we're comparing these regimens. Uh, this just shows you how in all of these various domains, the quality of life favored bendamustine and rituximab. Uh, with really no domain that was favoring the standard therapy that was either RCHOP or RCVP. So this isn't all anthracycline driven. This is also some of the ease of getting um, BR therapy. Here was the progression-free survival. Again, showing at, at more than five years of follow-up, uh, continued improvement uh, in progression-free survival of the BR versus the CHOP RCVP. And if you look just at the patients with indolent lymphoma there, you can see that there, again, is a benefit, um, actually a larger benefit than you see with obinutuzumab, interestingly enough, and, and that did get a lot of attention. So if I were to uh, summarize these results, I would say that progression-free survival, event-free survival, duration of response, all were significantly in favor of BR as compared to RCHOP and RCVP. Um, the greatest benefit was seen uh, when you compare it to CVP, and I will say the strongest benefit was seen in the mantle cell lymphoma group. No difference in overall survival. Um, if you look at the safety profile, so my interpretation of this is there was a minimally higher incidence of secondary malignancies, but many of those were skin cancers in the BR treatment group, and that is something that we do have to pay attention to. But clearly, none of that has had any impact on overall survival. Um, Andy emphasized a number of deaths that occurred in all of these trials, but then showed overall survival curves that were exactly um, superimposable. So the, the absolute number of these deaths remains quite small, and whether that's going to have an impact on a population is not necessarily clear to me. Here was a multi-center retrospective experience that was published last year um, that tried to compare BR versus RCHOP. Um, I'm only showing this to show again that overall survivals were, were similar and that this multi-center uh, retrospective study, again, the RCHOP curve looks rather similar to the SWOG RCHOP curve here, and BR did appear to be a little bit better as far as progression-free survival. So now, uh, should the gallium results change this? And then I'll try to add a, just a thought on, on how to interpret the antibody question in those results. So this was an MRD analysis that was done. Uh, this was uh, not part of the publication of the gallium trial, but this was presented separately at, at the ASH meeting last year. And what I'm showing you is just the MRD status by treatment arm at the end of induction therapy. 
And I think what you can see is I, I'm purposely just focusing on the rituximab group here because um, actually I'll just tell you, obinutuzumab seemed to make all the bars go somewhat higher. But if you just are comparing RCHOP to BR, you can see that there's this, a significant improvement in MRD um, to the number of patients that obtain minimal residual disease with bendamustine as compared to RCHOP or RCVP. So what does this mean? It just means that the remissions are deeper, presumably with the bendamustine, and that should predict maybe that you'd need less treatment long term. And in fact, um, if you plot out and just ask the question, doesn't matter what the treatment the patients got, if you achieved um, MRD negativity, those patients did better than the patients who did not. So let's just take a look at the trial itself. Um, again, obinutuzumab performed slightly better than rituximab, but non-fatal adverse events were higher with obinutuzumab. This included infusion reactions, infections, and cytopenias. Um, interestingly to me is that these curves separate early. We heard a lot this morning uh, about the importance of the early events in follicular lymphoma. And the two-year PFS with the rituximab treatment was 81%, and with the obinutuzumab treatment was 88%. It's one of the first large trials that has shown that you can improve two-year PFS. And whether that ultimately means that we've changed the natural history of a subset of these high-risk patients, I think remains to be seen. And that's something that I'm going to watch carefully, because if what we published uh, from the National Infocare study is true, that these patients are the ones who have survival events early on, we may start to see some survival differences emerge from this trial. So if we just tried to uh, make a conclusion on the bendamustine versus CHOP question, two large trials with long-term follow-up demonstrate benefit of bendamustine over CHOP and CVP with or without maintenance rituximab in upfront therapy of indolent lymphoma. Fewer infections, uh, improved PFS and time to net treatment, and these appear to be durable because these trials now have five to 10 year follow-up, and quality of life may be enhanced. I'll also say that avoiding anthracycline therapy uh, upfront allows use at time of transformation, which still is a problem in follicular lymphoma, which could potentially abrogate the need for platinum-based therapies on autologous stem cell transplant, given some recent publications suggesting that extended RCHOP is quite good therapy for transformed follicular lymphoma. And bendamustine-based regimens result in higher rates of MRD negativity with both rituximab and obinutuzumab as compared to CVP and, and CHOP-based regimens. Now, I'll also just throw out there the, the point that in the STILL trial, the BRIGHT trial, actually the SWOG0016 long-term follow-up paper was just accepted in JCO. We're now seeing close to half of patients 10 years after these treatments that remain free of disease. Uh, there are not that many cancers where you see patients who are in remission for 10 years and we still are telling everybody that they're not curable. Are we potentially curing a subset of these patients? Again, I think we have to see. I'm not going to say that with even only 10 years of follow-up. But if that's the case, it could be long-term that, that trying to obtain complete remission up front is an important goal. And finally, just a couple of thoughts on the obinutuzumab question. Um, in the gallium study, and MRD negativity after induction treatment was very high when bendamustine was used with either antibody. And in fact, the difference in both PFS as well as MRD comparing obinutuzumab and rituximab was smallest uh, in the bendamustine groups. Uh, for example, the PFS difference between rituximab and obinutuzumab on central read was only a 4% difference uh, favoring obinutuzumab when bendamustine was the induction therapy. Uh, increased deaths were observed during the maintenance phase of treatment from a variety of causes. And that's an important point. If you look at those colors that Andy showed, on that, uh, those dots, each of the colors were a different cause of death. So this wasn't all infection or all cancer. There were a number of different causes. And they really weren't observed in the still and bright trials. And it suggests to me, in the bright study, there were a subset of patients that got maintenance. In the still patient, no, in the still trial, nobody did. It suggests to me that maintenance may be a problem after bendamustine. Uh, and probably shouldn't be used routinely. 
And there's no survival benefit observed to date with maintenance treatment in follicular lymphoma. So given the short-term tolerability and outstanding 10-year results of BR without maintenance, that's what I favor as a standard chemoimmunotherapy induction for high tumor burden follicular lymphoma. And I'll acknowledge my team who uh, doesn't always agree with me, but uh, that's okay. <laughs> we'll see what they vote. Thank you.